My name is Robert Monroe. I'm a computational linguist. Uh, something you might not know about the world. Most people from most of history have been able to speak two to three languages, and they've been exposed to two or three other languages every day, I meaning there are other languages in the neighborhood that they couldn't speak. For a total of about five languages they could be exposed to. Uh, this has recently changed thanks to cell phones. Right now, if you dialed the right number in this phone, you could reach one of 5,000 different languages. Um, and increasingly, we're going to see situations like this in Haiti, where despite large-scale destruction, the phone towers are still operational, and people will be using their phones and their languages uh, when they call for help. Um, so I'll be talking about three projects today along these lines. Um, in Haiti, we had the problem where people were calling for help, but the responders didn't speak Creole, meaning these messages would be as meaningful to the responders, primarily the US military, as they are to most people here in the audience today. Uh, and as you can see, these are important messages. These are messages containing information that the responders do need to react to in a timely fashion. Uh, so we crowdsourced the translation of emergency text messages coming in. We translated in real time about 40,000 messages. Um, and we know we delivered the first food and aid to about as many people, which meant if you lived anywhere in the world and you came online and you helped translate, then you helped on average one person for every message you translated in real time. So this is the process here with thanks to Brian Herbert and Joss Nesbitt, uh, who got this translation platform going, Crowdflower hosted it later, and the great people at Tufts who were identifying the actionable items and working with the responders. Um, in addition to not knowing Haitian Creole, the responders didn't know Haiti. So this is a typical interaction in the online chat room between two people volunteering to translate. So Delilah in San Francisco, Apo in Montreal. Delilah is asking Apo for the location of Thomason. Um, and Apo says, this isn't yet on the map. This was before this had been mapped by the open uh, street map community. But Apo knows where this location is because there is in Montreal, this is where he grew up. He can click on a map, generate the coordinates. Um, and I like this particular story because this was a child delivery. So this was a child that entered the world with better medical attention than they would have otherwise received. One of the few success stories during Haiti. Um, and as Apo says, I know this place like my pocket. So the crowd knows where locations are even before they are mapped. Um, we had more than 1,000 volunteer translators in total, um, including a core of about 100 who helped um, for months on end, dropped everything they did. And most of them were people who had lost members of their immediate family, so it gave them a way to connect. Um, but the biggest flow of information in and out of Haiti wasn't from us, it wasn't even from international aid groups, it was from the diaspora. So when this message comes through, one of the people helping with the, the translation passes that information on. So the real information flow that we want to get is this community-based information flow. It's the diaspora helping their loved ones within Haiti, who are the real driving force behind so many of the unreported relief efforts. And like I tried to say, this, this technology existed a long time. It was the people that made a difference. Another project in Malawi, this is the Tachewa speaking region, partnering with Frontline SMS Medic, uh, the clinic we work with has two doctors for 250,000 patients, one hour per day managing text messages, just five seconds per patient per year. And so we want to apply machine learning to this data. Um, and there's many reasons to do this. We can identify outbreaks early on, so like Google flu trends, but looking at actual communications between medical professionals, route imported data quickly, so forward messages to the, um, the doctors only when they look like an emergency. The problem is that variation is the norm. This is the word patient across 600 text messages. And you can see that the majority of surface forms occur only once in the Chichero data, as opposed to the English translation, which is just the regular patient and the plural. However, this is linguistically predictable. Uh, I'm not showing the equations here, but given no prior knowledge of the language itself, we can employ three different kinds of artificial intelligence to normalize the data, spread out the morphemes and the components, and then learn as it sees more data to classify these messages. So the top red graph here shows that when we do have this subword modeling, it's almost as accurate as with the clean English translations. This is over just 600 messages. It tops out there at about 95% accuracy. Uh, third project right now is Pack Report. I played a very small part in this. There's some great people here. Please seek them out and meet them. Um, multiple volunteers in this case processed every single message using the Crowdflower platform. 
And what this means is that we get per task confidence. How much did each of the volunteers agree with each other when they tried to map this? Um, and how much do the volunteers with, agree with each other over multiple tasks, meaning that we can get an idea of the reliability of each of these reports. Um, and so this is one way of dealing with the, um, the problems of allowing volunteers to uh, commit value-added operations. So yes, we, we can address the crisis information bottleneck through crowdsource and machine learning. Uh, they're both scalable. Machine learning maintains privacy, but the crowds can add value. Thank you very much.